and all of you. We are glad that you have gathered with us in worship this morning on this glorious day. It's a wonderful day to get together and worship, to experience our Holy Spirit and our God this morning. We want to welcome especially those that are worshiping with us online. As we gather this morning, we come from all walks of life. Some of you are like in week two or three of school, and some of you begin tomorrow. And some of us are just having our normal life and going through the rhythm. But as we gather this morning from all walks of life, God meets us right where we are, right in the thick of it. As we worship this morning, as we come together in this time, may we be able to just take all those angst, all those to-do lists that clutter our hearts and minds and place them in God's hands. That in this time, his presence would be so magnified during the music and the prayers and the scriptures that it reflects in all that we say and do as we go forth this week. I invite you to bow with me for a word of prayer. Almighty and gracious God, on this glorious day, we gather to worship, and we gather to worship you alone. God, as we gather in this place, coming from all walks, coming from all seasons of life, oh God, surprise us in this place, in this opportunity to worship you. Oh God, may you be magnified in this opportunity to worship. May your grace and your joy and your peace be so magnified that we reflect that as we go forth into your world. Oh God, we lift our worship up to you this morning. In your son's holy name, amen. This morning, I invite you to continue worshiping with us as we sing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
Please be seated. Well, today is a special day in the life of our church. It is my vision for our church to have a thriving family ministry, a thriving youth ministry, a thriving children's ministry, a holistic ministry to parents and children alike. I believe it's important not only for the future, but for the present, for our youth to be formed in the faith, to be leaders today in their schools, in their families, in the world. And so for over a year, our director of youth ministry position has been open, and we've been praying for God to connect us with the next right leader uh, for our ministry. And God has answered our prayers abundantly in sending us the Reverend Dr. Eric Pugh to lead this next generation of youth ministry here at the church. I'm going to invite Pastor Eric and his wife, Corinne, and Maggie, his daughter, to join Amanda and I up front and all of our youth who are present to come and gather around us here. In the choir as well. Y'all, come on. We have many youth scholars, yes, in the choir there. If you've ever noticed the difference, the shiny robes are our youth, uh, youth scholars. And so they're going to come down and join us here too. So Pastor Eric comes to us from John Wesley Church. And you know, in the United Methodist system, we say goodbye one week and we say hello another week. And so he was in a service last week at his former church and is now here with us today. So I know how that feels and we're so glad to, to welcome you. Uh, also, I want to tell you a little bit about Pastor Eric. He's got uh, two other daughters who are at college, uh, Evelyn and Belle. And so we think of them today. And of course, this is Maggie and his wife, Corinne. There, we're glad that y'all are here with us too. Uh, Pastor Eric has a combined 13 years, I think I counted, of experience in youth ministry. And his last position was executive pastor at John Wesley Church. And so he brings uh, not only a love and a passion for youth ministry and discipleship formation, but he's got that kind of rare administrative acumen that's going to help take everything to the next level. Pastor Eric's a graduate of Perkins School of Theology, where he got his Master of Theological Studies, and a, he has, has a Doctor of Ministry from Garrett Evangelical Seminary in preaching. So we're going to be blessed by his gifts here as well. We want to pray for you as you begin your ministry here. And so Pastor Amanda and I are going to go uh, behind the rail, and I'm going to ask all of our youth to just kind of mob you as a little prayer mob, and we're going to bless your ministry here. So if our youth would gather around. Let's lay hands on Pastor Eric and his family. If y'all will kneel, if you can. All right. Here we go. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you have answered our prayers in sending us Pastor Eric. We are so grateful for the gifts that you've given him, for the faith that you've inspired in him, and for all the ways that he's led people to a greater awareness of your love, your presence, and your peace. God, as he comes and begins his ministry among us, I pray that you would fill him with joy. And even as he grieves leaving another community to join ours, God, I pray for a warm reception here. I pray that he would lead many to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, and that through his wisdom and example, he would inspire others to put their faith in you. God, thank you for our youth ministry, for our children's ministry. God, we pray that under his leadership, uh, all of our ministries would be strengthened so that we may reach out in an even more powerful way uh, to lead families into a greater awareness of your love. All of this, God, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Y'all may be seated. And as they're returning to their seats, just a word, we're going to have a welcome reception for Pastor Eric uh, upstairs on the sixth floor, immediately following our service today. He'll be out to, to greet you all uh, with me as we're exiting, and then he'll go upstairs for a pizza reception. So we invite all of our youth and their siblings and families to join us for that opportunity. At this time, I invite our ushers to come forward for the giving of our tithes and offerings. It's through your generous, generous offering in your tithes that we are able to be a church of action that puts God's love in action in a variety of ways of service and raising up young disciples and disciples of all ages. So this morning, as the offering plate passes by, I invite you to consider how you're growing in your discipleship. And how are you helping others grow in their faith as well? 
We are glad that everyone is here and we want to keep you in touch of all of those opportunities. So we encourage you also to be sure to sign in on the registration pads at the end of the pew and pass those down. It's an opportunity for us to stay in touch and make sure you're getting all of the updates. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks that you are a God of collaboration that gathers us and calls us to grow in faith together, that you are a God who collaborates in showing this love, this incredible love that you offer. But God, as we lift up our tithes and offerings today, multiplying for the benefit of your kingdom here and now, today and tomorrow. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
let us remain standing as we proclaim our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. mom or dad the first time they called you? Sometimes we pretend that we can't hear someone, especially if they want us to do something we don't want to do. A long time ago, Paul tried to tell some people the good news of Jesus, but many of them didn't want to listen. In today's story, we're with Paul in Athens. Paul was lonely in Athens. There didn't seem to be a single person there who knew or believed in Jesus. Dear God, he may have prayed, show me how to share your love with the people of this city. Beautiful statues, buildings, and artwork surrounded the people of Athens. Expensive temples filled with all kinds of idols seemed to be everywhere. Athens was known as a city overflowing with intelligent people. But as Paul walked around, he felt sorry for these people. They thought they knew so much, but they really didn't know the most important thing. They didn't know Jesus. Paul started talking to people. Soon his words began to make people think and ask questions. They wanted to hear what he had to say about Jesus. One day, someone invited Paul to speak at the Areopagus on top of Mars' hill. The Areopagus was a special place where philosophers met to talk and listen to the latest ideas. Such people were considered to be very intelligent and wise. It was an honor to be invited to speak there. Friends, Paul began, I can see that you are very religious. Everywhere I look, I see statues and altars to different gods. On one statue, I noticed the words, to an unknown God. I'm here today to tell you all about him. The true God of heaven made the world and everything in it. It is God in heaven who gives you life and breath to everyone. As he continued speaking, many of the people listened carefully. Then Paul told them about the resurrection of Jesus. Some of the people said, you're crazy. This is all just a bunch of nonsense. But there were a few who said, we want to hear more. Not very many people in the city of Athens believed in Jesus. They thought their own wisdom was better than God's wisdom. But there were some who became Christians. Paul was able to talk boldly to the intelligent people of Athens because he knew God. The more we know God, the one true God, the more we can share with others. So my challenge to you this week is to think about these two questions. What can you do to get to know Jesus better? And do you really want to know Jesus so you can tell others about him?
please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Our scripture this morning comes from Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 34. As I read, listen for a word from the Lord. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Oropagus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us. So we would like to know what it means. Now all of the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Oropagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription reading, to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, that I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even one of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, we will hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them. But some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Amarius and others with them. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Today we are wrapping up our summer sermon series called World Upside Down, which comes from a quote in the story that precedes the one we're reading today, where Paul and the apostles were accused of turning the world upside down with this news about one named Jesus, who was crucified on the cross and rose again for the sake of the world. That message is still transforming the world today. There's perhaps never been such an exciting time to be a Christian. Now, granted, it's a little more challenging than it maybe was a generation or two ago yeah, when this building was built, for example. There are memories of this building being full on Sunday mornings, people sitting in the stairs on the balcony, there being standing room only. Well, that was a time when Christianity was attractional, where people, when they moved from place to place, would look for the church of their denominational flavor and, and begin to join it. And there was more of a hunger and openness in the culture to the good news of Jesus Christ. Now things are a little more challenging. It's not just a field of dreams sort of strategy that grows the kingdom of God's footprint in the world. You know, field of dreams, right? If you build it, they will come. Uh, I know that we wish it was that way. Now, what brings people to an awareness of Jesus in the world? Well, it's you. It's us. 
It's you and I. It's, it's community. It's relationship. It's the ways in which we show forth the love of Jesus, the way in which we represent Christ in the world. That's how people come to know the love of Christ. And that's way more compelling than just opening your doors and seeing a building full, right? But that requires something of us, doesn't it? Requires the very best of us. It requires our focus. It requires our devotion. There's perhaps no greater passage in all of the book of Acts that speaks to this day and age than our passage that we read today. What is amazing to me is that Paul had set his sights on going to the seat of the Roman Empire, and yet the Holy Spirit saw fit to lead Paul to the seat of Greek culture, uh, a, a world that, that used to be a little bit more dominant but was now sunsetting, however, a world that still had tremendous influence through its philosophies. Many in the known world, even if they could not read or weren't literate, were shaped and formed by the Greek philosophies that Paul himself was encountering. Now, there is something so instructive for us at the very beginning of this passage that I would be remiss if I didn't point out. When Paul got to Athens and he began walking around, paying attention to their objects of worship, what did the text say he felt? He was distressed by what he saw. Now, I hear many a Christian today lamenting why, well, church buildings aren't more full on Sunday mornings. And I think part of the reason for that is that Christians, like others in the culture, have become distracted. We all have these mini computers in our pockets, and a lot of us spend significant time on our phones. Many do. If it's not a smart device, it could be a busy schedule. There are all kinds of things that could distract us from our primary task of paying attention. Paul paid attention. And Christians should be a people who pay attention. I want to ask you a question. I think this was Paul's focus as he entered Athens and saw all of the beautiful temples and the statuary and the artwork. What is breaking your heart? What is breaking your heart? You see, the answer to that question will lead you to your place of distress and will move you to action and compassion. Paul was distressed that the focus of this people was on everything but God, and he made it his singular purpose and aim to lift God's name high while he was there in Athens. What breaks your heart? What are you feeling distressed about? What is moving you to compassion, to act? Paul saw all of the idols that were around. What is an idol, if not something that we as humans place in the very place of God in our own lives? Something that we make to be God in place of God. That in and of itself is an idol. I think we could look at it this way as well. Anything that distracts us from one who should be at the very center of our entire lives, who should get all of our focus and our attention. What are the idols out there that are so distracting to us? I think information is one. Now, that's something that's really changed. People used to come to our church buildings, to synagogues, to, to religious houses in order to get information, in order to learn. Well, now in our pockets, you can even just speak out loud to your device and have it answer you from somewhere on the interwebs. And so information itself has become an idol to us. We become experts of our own making. We become self-reliant. I think that's another idol here in our culture today, right? We don't need anyone else. We can do it all ourselves. But I would stand to say we do need each other. We need community. 
We need to learn alongside of others who are struggling to learn as well. I think another idol that is breaking my heart is insistence on our own rightness. Our individual ideologies become the thing that matters more than anything else in the world. And as you explore that just a little bit, you see people setting aside their own ethics in order to stay true to their own ideology. That to me is troubling as well. When we seek to be guided by Scripture, that alone should determine where our sensibilities lie, what our true focus and aim should be. What breaks your heart? What leads you to action and compassion? One of my favorite quotes is from Frederick Buechner, who says that your purpose is where your deep gladness meets with the deepest needs of the world. That to me is so instructive for this culture that we're living in today. Some might call it post-Christian, where Christianity once was, well, the assumption, right? We, we were coming out of a time where you might assume that most everyone around you was a person of faith. Well, that's changing just a little bit. Now, people have walked away from the faith, or they just are kind of, meh, you know, agnostic when it comes to the faith. I say this presents us with a pre-Christian opportunity. We have the opportunity to introduce new generations to the good news of Jesus Christ, His crucifixion and His resurrection. Paul had this pre-Christian opportunity, as he did what he always does. He comes into Athens, he goes to the synagogue, and he begins to teach. And then he goes into the marketplace and teaches there as well. In Greek, the marketplace was not only a place where you would acquire goods, but it was also a marketplace of ideas. You would go to shop among all of the different things that were available to whet your fancy. You know, what's amazing now is that uh, our marketplaces are now more full of services than goods because our goods are being brought right to our doorstep. That's a pretty pretty interesting thing that's going on in our culture today. Um, but Paul meets the people where they are. He pays attention and ministers to the people's curiosity. Well, it turns out that he's not well received even in this place of hearing about different ideas. The people begin to accuse him of being a babbler. You know, we are too as Christians being accused of babbling, right, of, of not making sense to a culture that believes that what is here and now is all that matters. It was that way too in that culture. They believed that the material world was all that there is. This life is all we've got, they would believe and teach, and so we'd better make the most of it. They believed in that day and age that there was a big distance between divinity and humanity, and so we should seek to live quiet lives that are in gratification of our own goods, our own flesh. A mantra then would have been, if it feels good, do it. Sound familiar? Very similar culture. And Paul begins to speak about this one who came named Jesus, who lived and ministered to people's deepest longings and needs. He called disciples to follow him and equip them to teach others and to minister. He was crucified on the cross, but death could not keep him in his grave. God saw fit to raise him up from the dead, and new life is available to all in his name. But it turns out the Greek culture, you know, the word for resurrection is Anastasius. It's a feminine word. And so they heard that there's this God and this goddess that were foreign to them. It turns out they had no way to comprehend this, this philosophy, this new idea of resurrection. Also in this day and age, there were secret societies that they believed would tear their culture apart, and that you had to be indoctrinated to learn the, the things about the secret society. And so they called him to court, basically, brought him to the Oropagus, 
called him to Mars Hill, put him on trial. May we know the secrets of what you are teaching, the people ask. This may very well be Paul's most important sermon ever. It's about two minutes long if you read it slow in Acts 17, but I bet it probably took all day. We know Paul was a long-winded speaker, for we see in another chapter in Acts that he preached so long that somebody fell out of a window. I'm not going to preach that long today. But what we have here is a synopsis of some of the most important theology we find in the book of Acts. Paul pays attention. He says, I've been astounded as I've walked around your city and seen your objects of worship. I am moved by the way your hearts seek something beyond yourselves. But I encountered an inscription on an altar that read to an unknown God. And for Paul, that moved his heart. He discovered in that a longing for something that could fulfill the very desires that they were trying to fill in other ways. And so he said, let me tell you about that unknown God, the one that has been previously unknown to you. Let me make known. And starting from the very beginning of the Hebrew Bible, he walks them through the story of salvation that culminates in Jesus. There's some really wonderful wisdom in this passage. He says, for one, that God is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Does that feel like a God who is far off as they believed? Or does that really speak of a God who is very near to us? Yeah, he's telling them God is as close as your next breath. God is all around you, and God is within you, too, if you will seek after God and be led by God. That is a beautiful, beautiful word. He says that we are all God's children, sons and daughters of God. And he speaks about Jesus and about the resurrection power that comes from belief in him. So why is this so important for us today? Friends, we live in a world longing for resurrection, for new life, for hope beyond what is. And we have in Jesus the only one who can fulfill the deepest longings of every heart. You and I all know this personally. We've experienced it. And it is our work, our vocation to share this good news everywhere we can. But we have to be a people who pay attention. We have to be moved by the things that we see as distressing. We have to have hearts that break for the things that break God's heart. When we see someone trying to fulfill their deepest longings with something that's not Jesus, man, that's our time to step in and to share there is hope beyond this current situation. God loves you and wants more for you than what you currently know. Here's what's so compelling about this. There was this altar with the inscription to an unknown God, yet the people were not unknown to God. They were all deeply known by God, dearly loved. Our Bible teaches that God knows the number of hairs on our head that we were formed, God knew us before we were even formed in our mother's womb. God is crazy about each and every person. That is the deep reality here, and I think something that the world needs to hear from us. That though you might not know God yet, God loves you and draws near to you. This is proven in Jesus coming to earth to show us the way to die in our place and to be risen so that we can have new life that starts right now, today. We are the ones to whom God has entrusted the very words of salvation. And our presence in people's lives is what will begin to awaken them to God's presence in their own. And so, friends, we have work to do. But it starts with answering that basic question I lifted up before you. What breaks your heart. 
Where does your greatest joy meet the, the greatest brokenness in the world? I think that's the second question. And, and then, how are you open to where God leads you every day to speak to the deepest longings of the people around you? That's how people are going to be awakened to God's presence and power in their lives. That's how the world is going to continue to be changed. And that is worthy of our greatest focus and our greatest efforts. So what is unknown to some is known to us. Share good news broadly and in everything point to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the example of Paul being led by you into a place that didn't know about your son Jesus, didn't know about resurrection, a place that was even hostile to these ideas and a marketplace of ideas. It just didn't make sense to them. We thank you for Paul's persistence, where Paul persisted in sharing good news because he was so grieved by what he saw that he couldn't help but talk about you. God, help us to be like Paul. Help us to share good news broadly and in everything point to God. Lord, help us to minister to the curiosity of the world around us and free us from our own distraction so that we might pay attention to the people that you place around us. God, we are your people, your beloved children. Help us to remind others around us that they are your beloved daughters and sons as well carrying good news on our lips everywhere we go. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is still teaching disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have a tradition here at First Methodist to end every service in prayer. I'm sure we sing a song, but that's because God is moving among us. God might be calling you to this rail today where countless others have prayed before us to lay a burden down at the feet of Jesus, to thank God for a blessing in your life, to pray for a sickness, maybe for healing for yourself or for somebody else that you know. I pray as we sing our closing song that you'll pay attention to God's stirrings in your heart and that you'll respond in any way that the Lord leads. And so I invite you to come as the Lord leads as we stand to sing our closing song, Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow.
Friends, our goal is not to be the same tomorrow as we are today. We here at First Methodist seek to grow in our faith, to follow Jesus more closely, to, to deepen our dependence upon Him. And so I always want to leave our services with an opportunity to grow in your faith in the days ahead. We have a couple of opportunities that I want to let you know about. If you are not yet a part of a Sunday school class, Pastor Ann is beginning a brand new study on September 10th right here in the chapel. Uh, she will have two opportunities, one for those who might want to attend Sunday school after and those who are maybe new to a Sunday morning opportunity at 945 um, or at 10 o'clock. Uh, it's going to be based on the book, Your Sacred Yes. It's a, a wonderful opportunity in this fall season uh, to deepen your faith. Also, we've got a women's ministry table set up in the lobby. Our women's ministry is doing amazing things and gearing up for a great fall with book clubs, breakfast gatherings, days away trip, spiritual life, day retreats, a spring tea, and more. Man, I want to sign up. <laughs> you can do that today at the women's ministry table in the lobby. Also, Walk to Emmaus is vibrant here at First Methodist Church. We have a vibrant Emmaus community. Many have encountered Christ on the way and have found your lives changed by a walk to Emmaus. You're going to be hearing in the days and weeks ahead of opportunities to connect with this movement. Maybe God's calling you to go on a walk this fall or spring. And so we'll be uh, sharing opportunities for you to connect with the Emmaus communities and, and maybe find yourself uh, on a retreat with Jesus here coming up pretty soon. Finally, uh, we are trending on TikTok. We've been talking about our Main Street Indoor Park. We've had as uh, many as 90 people come uh, on uh, weekday mornings, and we need volunteers to help welcome people and to care for the people who come. And we're looking for the next steps to, to help connect the moms and others who come to the park uh, in community. And so if you're interested in helping, you can contact Courtney Hutchins, and she'll get you connected. I want to invite Pastor Eric and his family to walk out with Pastor Amanda and I. Um, I know you'll want to greet them uh, on your way out today. Let me send you forth with these words of blessing. Go forth as a people dearly loved by God, sharing good news with all that you encounter that others are loved by God as well. Go and pay attention to the brokenness around you so that you can offer good news everywhere you go. Go forth today and every day and be the church. Amen. Thank you.